Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 30th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week we open the history books. Well, one history book anyway. Maureen Ogle, author of Ambitious Brew, the story of American beer, joins us in the first of a two-part interview on the history of American beer. This week we go from the beginning to Prohibition. But first, I want to call attention to happenings in connection with a couple of other beer podcasts. Both Craft Beer Radio and Brew Crazy have started online forums recently. Johnny Max over at Brew Crazy asked me to pass the word along to my listeners, and I've been keeping up a bit uh, with the message board over at uh, Craft Beer Radio as well, so I thought I'd mention those to you. You can find those at craftbeerradio.com and brewcrazy.com, and... uh, take the opportunity to get all interactive. You know, I've got an email from listeners who want me to start up an online message board or forum on our site, but but I don't know. With uh, producing an, an audio and a video podcast now on a regular basis, I don't know that I have time to do that uh, as well as it should be done. So uh, in the meantime, check out those two new sites and uh, see what you think. Let me know. Speaking of the video podcast, the new ones out there, Basic Brewing Video, uh, Steve and I brew up a six-pack robust porter this week, and we also take a look at ten brewing gadgets that I've acquired in the past year that I've found quite handy. You know, it's hard to believe that next month will mark the first anniversary of the original episode of Basic Brewing Video, kind of like going back and looking at, uh, you know, the old kinetoscopes of uh, shows from the 50s to look at those early segments. I think we've come a long way, even in this short time, and there's good things coming along down the line. Uh, Along the same lines of uh, the the video podcast and the small batches, Donovan from Cary, North Carolina, writes, True to form, when I started homebrewing, I also bought every book I could on the subject, and as a result, I have about 6,000 beers I'd like to brew. (laughs) That sounds familiar. The idea of doing many batches is very appealing for branching out and trying new styles as well as for doing experiments. The only problem, Donovan says, is the yeast. My preference is to use high-quality liquid yeasts, but I certainly do not want to spend 7 bucks for a slap pack for a mini batch. Uh, now, of course, I could brew a large batch along with every mini batch, but to me that defeats some of the purpose of doing a mini batch in the first place. So I would be very interested in seeing a video podcast about various techniques uh, as to washing yeast, creating yeast cultures, etc. Uh, It sure would be nice to have a variety of yeasts on hand and ready to use at a moment's notice. Well, thanks, Donovan. That's that's an excellent idea for a show. In the meantime, I've discovered the uh, Safale brand of dry yeast. I believe it's from Fermentus. And uh, I've gotten some good results with the few batches that I've uh, brewed with those yeasts. I've used the um, Safael uh, S4, which is an English strain for a smoked porter, and it turned out real well. And their US 56, which is the popular American uh, ale yeast strain. I've used that for a couple of Amarillo ales, and I was I was quite happy with both of them. They're very clean fermenting, and the hop flavors were wonderful and bright. Uh, The advantage is that it's much cheaper than the liquid yeasts, uh, although there isn't the variety of strains uh, that the well-established liquid yeasts have. Uh, And also, I was able to pitch without a starter on a five-gallon batch and get a very fast and vigorous fermentation with those yeast strains. So uh, I'm sure that I'm going to continue using the liquid yeasts uh, mainly because of the uh, the tremendous variety of of, uh, uh, of the strains out there, but uh, you might want to check out those new dry strains out um, and just let me know what you think. You can uh, oh by the way you can also make a small batch of beer uh, with a moderate gravity when you're doing your mini batch and uh, like ten fifty or or less and use the yeast from that small batch to make a larger batch of beer. So you can stretch your money a bit more that way, too. Nathan from Greenway, Australia writes, in episode, uh, in last week's episode, you mentioned we should try having a Thanksgiving, which involves seeing family you rarely see, 
eating copious amounts of food, and having leftovers for weeks to come. Nathan says, in Australia, we have a similar tradition. It's called Christmas. <laughs> well, of course, we've got that up here, too. Uh, and with us, in our family, uh, we get two of those because we do Christmas with my family uh, the week before out of town, then Christmas Day here at home. Uh, so we, you know, we get to eat twice as much on that uh, holiday season. Makes me wish I had stocked up on lower gravity homebrew, um, m- you know, meaning lower calorie uh, homebrew before the uh, holiday season. Because boy, it sure takes its toll. Uh, well, there's a no- there's a lot more email that I want to I want to save for a later date, and I enjoy uh, getting the email uh, every day, and it's and it's a lot of fun to read and to answer. I've been kind of slow in, in answering uh, recently, and I appreciate your patience with that, but it's been a busy time. And also, uh, I've gotten some email bounced back. So if you haven't heard back from me at all, it's because you have uh, uh, given, you've made a typo in your email address using that online form, and uh, it's bounced back, and there's no way I can find you. So anyway, if you, if you haven't heard from me, shoot me another email, and, and we'll try it again. Just make sure you spell your email address right. Okay, now let's uh, get on to our conversation with historian Maureen Ogle. Maureen is a historian who says she didn't know much about beer when she decided to write a book about it. Her account of the rise of American beer will probably go against what you've heard as the traditional account of the story. I know it did with me. It went went against what I'd heard. Uh, But, you know, what do I know? Unlike me, uh, she's done the research, and I invited Maureen Ogle onto the podcast to talk about what she found. In this first part of our chat, we had so much fun that I just decided to uh, split it in two and, and do the next part uh, next week. Uh, in this first part, we work our way from the pilgrims to prohibition. Maureen Ogle, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me. It's nice to talk to you again. We met in Denver, right? Right, right. Briefly at the uh, at, at the, the uh, Sam Adams deal. Yes, at the Sad. <laughs> While well, everybody was standing around waiting for the Utopias to be poured. Yes, <laughs> that's right. For some for some reason, that was a popular gathering place. I don't know why. <laughs> can't having tasted it, I just can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> well, well, you've got you've. I've read your book, and it, and it's it was a fun read, and. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you that you could have saved a whole lot of time by coming to me first, or any home brewer, because we all know the story of American beer. <laughs> and it, let me let me lay it out for you, and you, maybe you can tell tell me where we where we go wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. O- okay. American beer uh, started off as as part of the culture with the Pilgrims, and uh, then uh, you know as time went on the. The uh, brewers across the country, in every community there was a brewer, and the diversity of beer in America was just wonderful and great. And then the evil of prohibition came along, and uh, the only ones, the only brewers that survived that 13-year failed experiment were these big brewers that brewed the plain yellow yucky stuff. And so they grabbed up all the smaller breweries and, and wiped out all the competition and uh, took away all the diversity and flavor in, in American beer. And then World War II came along, and uh, because of rationing, those big brewers started using cheaper ingredients like rice and corn in their beers. And uh, after the World War II was over, they just kept that. And so now, thanks to that, uh, most of Americans, all they know is the, the yellow fizzy stuff and not the great American beer that we started out with. How's that? <laughs> it's so wrong on <laughs> so many so many levels that where would you like me to start? How, how about now, uh, interestingly, of course, that when I decided to do this book, every other person that I would tell, by the way, I've started this new book and it's about beer, would tell me exactly what you just got done telling me. Just exactly. Well, so, it, it's y- good yeah, to know that it, it's good to know that my sources weren't wrong. <laughs> Yes, the great American myth about the great American beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wrong, wrong. <laughs> You're a nice guy, and I hate to tell you, but <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> well, part of what we do here on, on Basic Brewing Radio is we try to, to uh, 
to bust the myths, as as they say, whenever we come across them. So so help us out, Maureen. Start in the beginning and and tell me where that that story is wrong. Uh, well, you, you were wrong from the first words out of your mouth right down to the very last one. So let me just knock off the colonial thing first, because I, I I know that all of us have this who. People who are into beer have this image that somehow the founding fathers were sitting around fomenting revolution over tankards of ale. And, in fact, they were probably either drinking cider or rum mixed with fruit juices or milk. Yes, the people who settled colonial North America came from mostly what what is today the United Kingdom, the British Isles. And, yes, they came from centuries and centuries of beer tradition, but when they got here, they just dumped the beer tradition because it was too much work, literally speaking. They, they, they landed in the wilderness. They had to, to start from scratch with everything. You know, there weren't any houses, there weren't any hotels, there weren't any grocery stores, obviously. And just trying to survive was so difficult that ale and the production of barley, which did not grow particularly well in New England or the southern colonial colonies um, and hops, they were just too much work. And it was a lot easier to plant fruit trees, which required very little tending. And, and rum was a byproduct of British colonies in the West Indies. The molasses poured into the colonies and was converted into rum. And so colonists just stopped drinking ale. And so there really wasn't uh, much of a beer tradition through the entire colonial period. And there's also the issue of fuel, right? Because uh, to make a batch of beer, you've got to boil it. And if you've got to chop down trees and, and all that, uh, it's a lot easier just to ferment a bunch of uh, apple juice, right? Yes. Cider is cider is so easy to make, and fruit trees are so easy to grow, relatively speaking. Labor was always in short supply. There, there was a labor shortage in what eventually became the United States right through the Civil War. So for roughly 300 years, or however many years that is, I can't do the math that fast, there was always a labor shortage, so people were always looking for ways to cut back on labor costs and and to do things that in a way that didn't require labor and you're right about the fuel i mean if you have a choice between burning up a lot of firewood to stay warm in new england where the temperatures were much colder than these people were used to or using that fuel to make beer i I can tell you where the fuel got made plus you know the the thing about alcohol is people drank it all the time because there wasn't any safe water right You, you didn't have any faucets so you couldn't turn it on and if people were going to drink, they needed to have the most cost-efficient drink that they could have to hydrate because everybody worked hard. So beer was just not at the top of anybody's list of things to drink. So I have been criticized soundly by a number of people for not starting the book in the colonial period. But the reason that Ambitious Brew opens in the 1840s and not the 1640s is because, frankly, there ain't much to say about beer during the colonial period except what I just told you. And, you know, that's not terribly interesting when you get down to it. I cover all that in the book, but, but, I, but I do it very briefly because, frankly, I don't think it's historically significant myself. Now, the next thing you'll tell us is that George Washington actually didn't chop down the cherry tree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I kind of think he didn't, actually, but, you know. And, you know, and people always come back at me and say, well, George Washington made beer and Thomas Jefferson made beer. Yes, probably everybody made beer. They made what was called small beer that, for example, they would drink at breakfast and children would drink it, again, because you have to hydrate. The human body can't live without fluids. So everybody's making beer, but it's relatively unimportant, and it's being made, essentially, it's being home-brewed in very small batches, and if people have their choice, they're definitely going to pick something else to drink. And there was almost no commercial brewing. So I guess, you know, the home brewers among us could look back and say, well, the founding mothers and fathers, especially the mothers, were busy home brewing, and that was certainly true. But beer just wasn't, it just wasn't terribly important relative to other kinds of alcoholic beverages. So we home brewers can still hold on to that part of the myth. Yes, you you can um, look back with pride at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, who, well, he wasn't making it himself. I'm sure his slaves were making it for him. But yeah, I mean, people people were home brewing. The, the, there were very few commercial breweries in the colonial period. 
almost all of them were located in port towns like Boston and Baltimore because they, they made the beer um, to these very pale ales that were very hoppy because hops, as I'm sure you all know, is a preservative. And they made the beer to go on ships that were headed off to Africa or Europe or wherever. But, the, but commercial brewing of the sort that we think of today where there are breweries all over the place, no, didn't happen. So when did American beer first start uh, into its own? In the, I opened the book in the 1840s, and I picked that time very deliberately because if you're looking for a moment when someone started to make beer on a commercial scale – and when beer started to become somewhat more common, that's the moment you need to look because that is when the first big wave of German immigrants came in. Germans had, had been emigrating since the early 1700s, but not in any particularly big waves. And they, like everybody else, didn't, didn't keep their beer coming with them. They also found themselves drinking other things. Here's an interesting statistic. In some ways, I think this kind of sums the whole thing up. In the 1820s in the United States, you know, the revolution's over and now it's a country, there were something like 14,000 distilleries making mostly whiskey, but there were only 200 breweries. Then if you flash forward, flash forward from the 1820s and 200 breweries, by 1860 there were, I'm trying to pull this number now out of my head, uh, something like 1,500 and the difference was these German immigrants who came in, who started making beer mostly for each other at first. And so that's why I opened the book when I opened it, because to me, if you're looking for the start of a truly American beer, you need to look at those German immigrants. And what they made was lagers. That's right. They were making, uh, they were trying to make a, a Bavarian style as opposed to a Bohemian style. Most of those immigrants came from Bavaria or Prussia, and the people who were making the beer, and among those immigrants were Philip Best, who's the guy who founded what became Paps Brewing, and Frederick Miller. These guys knew how to make a Bavarian-style beer. So they were making a lager using four ingredients, water, malt, hops, and yeast. And yes, they're making lagers. So as you might imagine... Um, the, the early German brewing industry in the middle of the 19th century was located where the Germans settled. And for a number of reasons, they tended to settle in northern climates because, as you can imagine, it's a little tough to make lager in, say, Alabama if you don't have refrigeration. Or Arkansas. <laughs> or Arkansas. Unless <laughs> you can gonna... find some caves. If you can find yeah. some caves in Arkansas. You have caves there, right? You have, aren't there a lot of caverns there? Well, anyway, you, you get my point. Uh, the, the, the Germans tended to settle in the northern United States, and they tended to go west because they were looking for land and because other German immigrants who preceded them had advertised the benefits of places like Missouri and Wisconsin. And so that's where the bulk of these people ended up settling, also in New York and in Philadelphia. And that's, this is really uh, the story of the American entrepreneur, uh, these German immigrants who come into the country and and uh, start their businesses from literally nothing, and uh, they become popular and, and become successful, and they, they gain uh, the American success story, right? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, when I, when I set out to write this book, I really thought I was going to write a book about beer, which, which I should tell your listeners that I didn't know anything about. I don't have any connection with the brewing industry. I didn't know anybody in the brewing industry. I didn't even drink beer. I, I was a complete blank slate. So I, I thought I was starting out to write a book about beer. And what I discovered about halfway through was that, in fact, as you just said, what I, what I really found myself writing about was the pursuit of the American dream. I, I, uh, these guys did, in fact, come over here and gamble everything on their ability to make beer initially for other German immigrants because Americans themselves, native-born Americans who were not of German descent, they didn't even drink beer, right? So when someone like Philip Best or Frederick Miller came over here, his intention was to make beer for other German immigrants. And after the Civil War, another generation of immigrants, including Frederick Papps, 
and Adolphus Bush, two names that I'm guessing your listeners will know, they realized that if they really wanted to make it big, if they wanted to be rich, very rich, they were going to have to figure out how to persuade non-German Americans to drink beer. They needed to expand their audience. And so that's what they did. And they created a uniquely American lager that non-German Americans would drink. And therein lies the most controversial part of the book. <laughs> Sock it to us, Maureen. Tell us. Okay. <laughs> this is the part that I have actually told people People have told me they just don't believe me, as if I just made this up. What people like Adolphus Bush figured out was that the average non-German American simply wasn't going to drink these very heavy, malty, yeasty beers. To a German, beer was part of the food on the table. Now, I know that sounds a little peculiar because we're Americans have always had a lot of food. That's the one thing that has always distinguished the United States. Relatively speaking, we have more food than anybody else in the world. And in the 19th century, the average American ate way more calories per day because we had more calories to eat. There was just more food here than anybody else in the world. That was not true in Europe, where food was always, uh, food supplies were erratic. There was more warfare. There was more general malnourishment. It wasn't that people were starving, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of food to go around. And Germans treated beer as part of their food. They really thought of beer as liquid bread. But an American who was used to eating a lot of meat, meat two or three times a day, and had a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of protein, they didn't want this beer that was so filling and so heavy. So what are you going to do? Well, if you're Adolphus Bush, you look around for something a little lighter in body. And by that time, in Bohemia, in the eastern parts of Europe that were known as Bohemia, there was another kind of beer. The most famous of today, today is Pilsner or Kell. It's widely regarded as perhaps the finest beer in the world. And it is different. A Bohemian lager is different than a Bavarian lager. It's, it's lighter in body. It's ever so slightly more effervescent. And what a lot of brewers like Adolphus Bush and Frederick Papps realized was, if they could fashion an American version of that, they could probably persuade Americans who were used to eating meat three times a day to drink beer. Well, the only problem was that the only way to do that was to import the barley from Europe, and that became the big hang-up, because the, the barley strains that were native to North America simply wouldn't work. They made a beer that was way too protein-rich, had too much starch in it, and had all this gloppy haze in it. You couldn't make a bohemian-style beer using North American barley. But if you tried to import the barley, frankly, you were going to go broke, because back then the only way to import the barley was to load it on a ship, and by the time it got to the United States, rats would have eaten about a third of it, and water leakage would have destroyed the other third. So what are you going to do? You're going to mix around. You're going to you're going to experiment with the mash to figure out a way to lighten the body of the beer using a North American barley. And what these guys figured out was that if they added corn or rice, they could create a near duplicate of a Bohemian lager. But, of course, it wasn't a bohemian lager anymore. It was a uniquely American lager. And so all that corn and rice that people love to complain about today actually showed up in the beer starting in the late 1860s, right after the Civil War. And it wasn't cheaper. It was not cheaper. It, it was definitely not cheaper to do this. There was a huge demand for, for corn, for example, because Americans did eat meat usually at every meal, and corn, as you you probably know because you live in Arkansas, corn is used to fatten both hogs and cattle. So there was enormous demand for corn, and, and, so, and so brewers are basically competing for this crop. Plus, uh, rice had become an enormous export product. So, yeah, it was, for example, a bottle of Budweiser 
which was an enormously popular beer from the day it first appeared in 1876, a bottle of Budweiser cost the equivalent in today's money of $17. It cost Adolphus Bush $2 a barrel more to make Budweiser than his conventional St. Louis lager. It was not cheap beer. So, now, I know nobody wants to hear that, <laughs> but I'm not making it up. <laughs> uh, well, I probably had the same reaction that everybody else has yeah. when they first hear that. In Denver, I said, well, where'd you get this stuff? <laughs> yeah, are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. where did no, you I'm get not, this stuff? I've gotten a lot of that. There, are, As I said, there are some people who just who are assuming. Uh, I've actually been accused of being um, in the employ of the big brewers and that they told me what to write. And I'll just tell you flat out that those are fighting words for me because I value my professional integrity, and I am in no one's employ. And Anheuser-Busch, for example, refused to even talk to me. So it's not like I had a lot of cooperation from the big boys, and I no one told me what to say. I just want to get that out there. So where did you get the information? Uh, through spending hours and hours and hours pouring over... 19th century brewing trade journals and today there are brewing trade journals where and brewing chemistry journals where people exchange ideas and chemists talk about their latest researches into brewing chemistry and so forth and in that, that was true in the 19th century as well so i went back and read the old 19th century brewing journals in which brewers discussed ways of trying to expand their audience, trying to figure out how to duplicate these beers. Anton Schwartz, who I rank as one of the two or three most influential people in American brewing history, Anton Schwartz was trained in Bohemia and emigrated to the U.S. in 1868 and went to work immediately for the first American brewing trade journal, and he was instrumental in teaching brewers how to use these adjuncts. They're called, the technical term is adjuncts. If you add corn or rice, you're adding an adjunct to the beer. And he had trained at a polytechnic in Bohemia where a professor there named Carl Balling, this is probably way more than anybody wants to know, but at least people will know I'm not making this stuff up. He had trained under a guy in Bohemia who had been interested in trying to figure out how to help brewers there stretch their um, scarce crops. Europe is very, very crowded, and the cost of brewing products kept going up because the farmland was needed for food because the population kept going up. So he was trying to figure out, what can I do to help them make the same quality beer but add something to the mash that will help them lower costs? So he was actually introduced, trying to figure out how to lower costs. But the brewers jumped on this as a way to use native barleys and the strains of barleys that are available now are different because they've been bred over the past 150 years for various purposes. But these brewers in the United States learn from him how to make these beers. So corn and rice have been in the beer in the United States for whatever many years that is, 140 years or whatever. I'm terrible at math. <laughs> and it, it didn't get added to the beer after World War II. And I might add that Americans loved this beer. This was the beer that made Adolphus Bush and Frederick Pabst the two largest brewers in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world. People were sucking this stuff down as fast. And Americans loved this beer. And to a, to a certain extent, um, the popularity of this beer and, and probably the greed of the brewers to expand and expand and expand um, – Shot them, they shot themselves in the foot because they wound up with um, these uh, saloons uh, that were uh, that were nasty places to be and, and nasty places for communities, and uh, that essentially turned communities against beer and uh, started the prohibition movement, right? Well, that yeah, that's a that's a fairly accurate version. I don't I don't know that I would use the word greed because I'm 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 playing the devil's advocate here. It's not clear to me why it's a bad thing for a man to want to get rich. Okay, so I'll, I'll just I'll just say that. But then but then I will say about the saloons. Back then, it was perfectly legal for a brewer to also own the retail outlets where the beer was sold. So. As you might imagine, every brewer worth his salt had, like the, the Miller family, for example. The Miller family invested in 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of um, real estate ventures, many of which they turned to saloons. Anheuser-Busch had lots and lots of saloons scattered all over the country. The problem, as you point out, is that some of these saloons, not all of them, but some of them really were, frankly, fronts for prostitution and gambling. And there were saloons everywhere. I, I have an example in the book, and I, I'll probably get this slightly wrong, but on, on one block in San Francisco, on, Howard, on one stretch of Howard Street in San Francisco, there were eight saloons on one side of the street and eight on the other side. And what brewers would do is buy up the corner lots, what they really wanted. So you might have, in Milwaukee, for example, you might have a Schlitz saloon on one corner, a Paps saloon on another corner, a Miller saloon on yet another corner, and the Blatt's saloon on the fourth corner at an intersection so yes the, but but that's where the beer was being sold it, it was 95 percent of the beer sold was on tap which is the opposite of today when only about five percent of beer is sold on tap in this country today and it was being sold in saloons and yes some some people thought that the united states would be better off without alcohol and they set out to shut down the saloons, and their reasoning was very simple. If you could shut down the saloons, the brewers wouldn't have any place to sell their beer, and the brewers would go out of business and everybody would be happier. And they, let me clarify, I'm, I'm a capitalist myself, so I think... Good for you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, profit is not a dirty word, but it seems like to me that uh, in a couple of instances uh, in your account of, of uh, the history of American beer, the big brewers like I say, shot themselves in the foot with, maybe you don't want to call it greed, but at least it's reckless um, expansionism in their, in trying to grab up as much market share as they could uh, from each other and, and new markets. And, and in doing so, they alienated uh, a large part of the, of the population. That, 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 that is true. In fact, I have an exchange in the book, where, and, I, and I included it because I was trying to kind of summarize the point you just made. It's, it's, a, it's a, from a letter that a guy named um, uh, Charles Nagel wrote to August A. Bush. August A. Bush was the son of Adolphus Bush. And Charles Nagel essentially said what you just said. Look, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You've got to figure out some other way to dispense of your beer without having these hundreds and hundreds of sleazy saloons because the public is turning against you. And if you want them to be on your side... You know, people are going to vote with their self-interest. If they don't want 15 saloons per block, they are going to do something to act on this. But but the brewers, by that time, it was too late. They they had found themselves in a bind. They had become completely dependent on the saloons, which they owned. I might add, it wasn't like they were selling the beer to a saloon owner. In the most in most cases, the the brewery actually owned the saloon, and the saloon keeper worked for the brewery. It, by by roughly 1905, 1910, it had become this vicious circle, and there really wasn't any way to get out of it without shooting, without a brewer shooting himself in the foot. And so, yes, they they did in fact, in some sense, bring about their own demise. Sad to say. I mean, they had they had expanded their brewing capacity so much that they had yes. to uh, do yes. these kind of kinds of things. It, exactly. It, you know, it, it, once Adolphus Bush made the decision that St. Louis wasn't a big enough market and that he was going to go after Texas, for example, then he had to build a big enough brewery to supply this new market. Well, the more he invested in equipment and brewing, the more he needs to keep the vats fill, full, right, because he needs to operate them 24 hours a day. And that means he needs to go after more territory. So maybe he'll go after California or maybe he'll go after Utah. And so, yeah, it, and, and that meant he had to build more saloons, and then he had to build a bigger brew house. And these guys, here's a perfect example. From about 1870 right up until about 1910 or so, these brewers were engaged in nonstop construction. They were constantly expanding. There was never a moment at Anheuser-Busch, for example, when there wasn't some major construction project going as they tried to expand facilities to keep up with these markets that they had created. So... Yeah, it was um, it was obvious the catch twenty two they had gotten themselves into. I mean, it was obvious for me looking back a hundred years later. And there were some some really interesting innovations that happened uh, to fuel to help fuel that or to accommodate that expansion. Uh, the use of refrigerated railroad cars and and uh, coming up with bottling and and things that uh, help distribute the product more. Uh, 
Uh, yes, the, yes. The brewers were, you know, we don't really think of them as kind of um, leaders in innovation, but they were at the time. They were the first to use refrigerated rail cars. Uh, Gustavus Swiss, the meat guy, usually gets credit for that, but he, he came along with refrigerated meat cars about six years after Adolphus Busch. Uh, automated bottling, which was a very big deal, because even making glass on a big scale was the technology was so new that brewers were the ones who were really propelling it forward because they they some of them did want to bottle their beer anheuser busch in particular wanted to sell Budweiser for the person they made it for um, in bottles um, the Brewers were the first ones to use mechanical refrigeration, which allowed them to replace ice, which had been the main coolant after about eighteen seventy um, They were the first to use pasteurization commercially, they had these incredibly automated, um, basically they were factories. They, called, they didn't call them breweries, they called them factories. And as much as possible, they automated to lower their production costs. And so like they had these big mechanical arms that were lifting and turning the grain when it was drying. They used conveyor belts to move grain from one place to another. They, they were, these factories were marvels of automation. And also, they, um, uh, the, on the marketing side of things, uh, putting the uh, the beer in glass bottles allowed them to brand their product instead of having it just uh, come anonymously out of a tap somewhere. Right. That, again, the vast majority of beer was sold on tap. It, again, it's completely the opposite of what it is today. But the largest brewers, who were really the only ones who could afford to do this because it costs money to put that's one of the reasons that a bottle of Budweiser cost 17 bucks because it was in a bottle. Um, but it did allow, if, if Anheuser-Busch was selling its beer in, say, San Francisco, which was a very big market for the Midwestern brewers, he, he used the label as a way to advertise. Because otherwise, they didn't really have to advertise that much because they're selling the beer in the saloons that they own, right? So in some sense, they didn't really know that much about marketing. But they also knew that they needed to somehow get the label out there. And so when they, were, when they were going after this sort of higher class mark at the higher ends of restaurants and taverns, especially ones associated with hotels, they would sell beer in a bottle just so that they could use the label. Of course, that also backfired because sometimes people would soak the labels off and then put them on different bottles. Or when the bottle was empty, believe it or not, people sleazy saloon owners would just reuse the bottles and fill them up with whatever local swill they had on hand. So <laughs> it wasn't a guarantee that you were protecting your name and reputation, but it, but they tried. So let's let's skip around a little bit and let's let's okay. let's head to prohibition. The, uh, the nation has uh, entered the uh, is it called the great experiment? Yeah, the fail yeah. <laughs> the the really <laughs> stupid experiment. <laughs> <laughs> but with all good intentions, uh, at least uh, for the people who organized it, uh, we headed into Prohibition. And what happened to the brewers in this country at that point? Well, by the time the Volstead Act and the 21st, uh, sorry, the 18th Amendment went into effect in January 1920, by that time, breweries had already been shut down for two years because of World War One, And something like 75% of Americans had already been living under some form of state or local prohibition for at least a decade. So by the time prohibition officially went into effect, all but a few hundred brewers had already shut down. In 1890, I think there were 2,300 brewers. And by, by 1918, when Woodrow Wilson ordered the brewers to shut down because of the war, there were something like, I don't know, 600 left. There weren't a lot left anyway. So Prohibition came along, and if I remember right, 185 breweries kept their doors open in January 1920. A lot of those did not make it through the next 13 years. They, they just couldn't survive. And as Prohibition wore on, and it was clear that nobody wanted near beer, which is what the brewers had banked on, People, the Bush family actually built a separate factory, a brand new factory to make non-alcoholic beer in and found out pretty quick that they had just wasted their money. Um, and then, of course, the stock market crashed in 1929, and that pulled a lot of breweries under almost immediately. And frankly, even Anheuser-Busch and Schlitz and Pabst, which had the deepest pockets 
even they were on the verge of going under by 1931 because the economy had just bottomed out. So if prohibition had not been repealed when it was, it's not clear to me how many of them would survive. But let me just make one point about prohibition. One, one of the myths that you mentioned right at the top of the interview was that during prohibition, only the really rich, big family breweries survived. And in fact, that's not true. The Yingling, the Yingling family survived, and they were certainly not a big, deep-pocketed company. The Line and Kugels in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, survived. A lot of small family breweries survived by making really smart choices about how to invest what little money they had. The perfect example is the Miller family. I know we all think of Miller today as this huge brewing behemoth, but Miller was a completely no-account brewing company until the 1950s. And the only reason they survived is because the Miller brothers and sisters had invested so much money in real estate of all kinds, and that's what kept them going. They, they, they were not a big, rich, you know, deep-pocketed brewery. They just invested their money wisely. So diversify is the, yeah. uh, the investment advice for Maureen Ogle. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. like the Yingling, the Yingling family, for example – realized that they were going to have to rely on investments, and one of their investments, believe it or not, was a dance hall in Harlem in New York, that they, a jazz club that they, you know, turned out to be a pretty lucrative investment for them. But they also decided to make ice cream, which a lot of breweries did because they were used to dealing with refrigerated trucks. And that, brew, that, that ice cream company was so successful for the Yinglings that they actually kept it open until 1985. So, you know, it was diversification and making really smart choices about what to spend your money on. Nobody wanted near beer. That was for damn sure. And so that was kind of a bust right off the bat. Now, this at this point in time, uh, we we come up with a, a question that is is to the the topic of this uh, this show usually, and that that's homebrewing. I mean, right. during this time, uh, there were brewers who made malt extract. For homebrewers, right? Yeah, yes, yes. The, the thing that I think most people don't know about Prohibition is it was legal to make alcohol in your home. If you could find the materials to make it with, you could make anything you wanted. What you couldn't do it was sell it. And so if you and I could go back in time to, say, 1925 and go into a grocery store, we would find on the grocery store shelf all the ingredients, for example, for making wine. It would be this um, grape uh, extract, and, and, it would, and the directions would say very clearly, do not allow this to ferment for six months as it may become wine. Well, of course, everybody <laughs> knows that's exactly why you're buying this stuff. And the same thing with, with the malt extract. We could go into a grocery store and buy all the stuff we needed to make beer. But, and a lot of people were making beer at home. I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners have fam have had family stories handed down to them of their grandfathers, great grandfathers, grandmothers making beer in the basement during Prohibition. Well, I, but, I can I can go one better than that. Okay, you were you, well. I know you're not that old, so you weren't making. Well, it. my okay, my dad uh, mm -hmm. tells a story of when he was uh, three or four years old. This is back in the early 30s. Uh, he recalls the sheriff coming to the house with his men and. Uh, breaking bottles and, and brewing equipment because my grandfather was apparently selling homebrew. And, uh. <laughs> and they took my grandpa away. And uh, luckily he wound up not going to jail or anything. The, the judge got him uh, fixed up with a, a government uh, work program because the, you know, the reason that grandpa was making uh, homebrew and selling is because he was trying to feed his family. So, right. So, uh, yeah, they, a lot of people have stories of, of homebrewing and some of us have uh, family stories of of homebrewers gone uh, <laughs> gone astray. <laughs> <Homebrewers> gone bad. <laughs> Actually, your, your poor grandfather. I'm telling you, that that's a really bad piece of luck because basically there weren't anywhere near in the ballpark of federal agents to actually enforce any of the laws. So you know, some overzealous agent must have found out about him and said, "Well, let's make an example of this guy." Well, and, it, and it's kind of ironic because if you know anything about the history of Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was kind of the den of iniquity of uh, of the South. I mean, there was there was gambling and speakeasies, and and the gangsters really? came down from Chicago. Uh, huh. So that may be your next book. <laughs> Actually, I've already started my next book. I don't know, but maybe the one after that. <laughs> so anyway, homebrewers, people were, and I didn't know was it, it was legal to make homebrew. You, you could make things at home as long as you didn't do what your grandfather did, which was try to sell it. 
But you see, most people, like like up in the hills, I mean, our image of prohibition is, is that there are either gamblers or, you know, the mob bringing things over the Canadian border or a bunch of hillbillies up in the Appalachians distilling and the federal agents showing up and smashing the stills. Well, these guys are selling the stuff. That's what's not legal. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't make things for commercial purposes. You, listen, if you had gone to a liquor store on December 31st, 1919, and bought 65 cases of whatever, scotch or whatever, it was perfectly legal for you to have that in your house and to drink it. And a lot of people did that. They just stocked up. But you couldn't sell the stuff. That's what was illegal. So what else significant happened during the, the years of prohibition uh, that is germane to the conversation? Um, I think the well... Prohibition had an enormously important long-term effect on drinking in America. Here's the one th- people are saying to me, what surprised you most? Here's the one thing that I think surprised me the most out of all the things that surprised and amazed me when I was researching this book. The people who spearheaded the prohibition movement were really smart about what they did. They are the original political action group, and nearly every political action group today models themselves on, including the neo-prohibitionists today, model themselves on the people who brought us prohibition. But they did such a good job of persuading Americans that alcohol was evil that in actual fact, and despite our image of prohibition, the vast majority of Americans actually obeyed the law. And they weren't out in speakeasies. They weren't buying illegal gin. They just flat out stopped drinking. And that really hurt brewers when Prohibition ended. Because people who did choose to drink during Prohibition sure as hell weren't wasting their time drinking homebrew. They were off drinking the stuff with a kick. Namely, really bad champagne, really bad gin. You know, they they were drinking alcohol, distilled liquor. And so when Prohibition ended, either Americans chose not to drink at all, or what they wanted was a martini. And the people who got caught in the middle were the brewers. And that proved to be absolutely devastating to the brewing industry. And maybe that's where we'll pause for this week. And then uh, if you'll if you'll stay with us, we'll, we'll pick up the conversation next week post-Prohibition. That's great. And then and then I can tell everybody about the fascinating stuff I learned about homebrewing. Hey. <laughs> well, thanks, Maureen. You're welcome. Well, thanks again to Maureen Ogle. Her book, again, is Ambitious Brew, The Story of American Beer. And you can find a link to her book and to her blog in the uh, description of this week's episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Next week, Maureen takes us into modern times, and uh, we're going to hear about uh, the craft brewing movement and home brewing as well, getting back more on the topic of the show. (laughs) And uh, after hearing her account next week, I think that you'll believe that the golden age of beer in America is today, and we as home brewers are a big part of it. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. And uh, I've got news. In our our first DVD, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, it's now... Uh, if you buy it uh, online and and soon coming soon to uh, the shops, is uh, it's not region encoded anymore. The uh, first run of that was uh, encoded for region one, and uh, now we are in the uh, second run and uh, the second edition, I guess you'd say, and th- they're not encoded for region uh, one, no region encoding, and uh, in this version of uh, introduction to extract home brewing. Uh, we have a little section in there on how to make a starter and uh, such as that. So, new and approved. Uh, in our introduction to extract home brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step by step from boiling to bottling. And in basic brewing, stepping into all grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it. 
from us online, and I'll pack it up my own self. Uh, thanks to everybody who's been clicking on our Amazon.com link, by the way, and doing their holiday shopping on there. It's uh, fun to see what people are buying, even though I can't see who's buying what. I can't see what you're buying. Or I can see what you're buying. I just can't tell who you are. Uh, but that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening and thanks for supporting us in all the ways that you do. Whether it's spreading the word or whatever you do, I just appreciate it. It's, it's a blast doing this thing. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson, who did our logo as well. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.